This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 2, Habanaria. Piper lit out a bored sigh, tapping one of her shoes against the chimney beside her. She shifted her hands, which were lazily holding on to an old roof ornament. From this vantage point, she could always spot her targets. But it had been a slow day, even by her standards. Ever since she was a child, scrounging about the streets for her next meal, she could pick out the easiest marks. Those with too much coin or jewelry for their own good. A bit of training from the School of Hard Knocks, and she had grown up to be one of the best pickpockets in Silverport. Not that that meant much, since the tiny trading town was on an island with barely a thousand permanent residents. But there were traders, travelers, and missionaries aplenty that stood out like sore thumbs. Piper drew down the brim of her old leather hat, hiding her eyes from the sun as she watched the hustle and bustle on the street below. Occasionally, a mark would catch her eye. A finely dressed merchant with gold cufflinks, an ornate silver pocket watch, and a ruby brooch on the left side of his waistcoat drew far too much attention to himself as he barked at the commoners. She shook her head. A merchant with that much wealth on display would never travel without some muscle close at hand. She turned to look down a different street. There was a woman in a gorgeous dress full of ruffles, lace, and elegant beadwork. She even wore a silk corset. What a beautiful ensemble. It glittered and glistened in the dull light of the dry afternoon sun. But on further inspection, she had no handbag or obvious items of value that would be easy to pilfer. Piper was getting ready to call it a day and go see what food she could requisition from the grocer stands three streets over. Then she spotted him. A man with a dazed look stumbled out of an alleyway, looking, for all the world, like a lost little puppy. He was dressed in a richly dyed crimson red coat that reached down to his knees. Piper's mouth started to water. The loose-fitting coat was covered in pockets, and though the man was a bit dirty, he looked every bit the rich bastard. He even seemed to have some of those metal augments that the gentry found so fashionable these days. With a smile on her lips and a gleam in her eye, Piper slid down the clay tiles of the roof and dropped down to the street, disappearing into the crowd. Vel nearly wretched. The stench of salty air and weak old fish only grew stronger as he walked. Reasoning that if he followed the smell of the market, he might find a central hub of the small port, he tried his best to determine the direction of the odor. If he couldn't find any information on his brother, maybe there would be someone willing to tell him where he was, or, better yet, how to leave. The throngs of people bustling around him, going on with their daily lives, paid him no mind, despite his obvious foreign appearance. In the last nine months, he and his brother had traveled to many worlds and seen many species of intelligent life, most humanoid. But Vel had not seen a group quite this diverse since visiting the Underwell, which had been a dumping ground of stranded dimension travelers, himself included. Here, there were many that looked perfectly human, but everywhere he looked, there were creatures that deviated significantly. Some had vaguely human shapes, with the right number of appendages, but their eyes were set far too up on their heads, giving them long, flat faces. There were creatures that appeared to be literally carved from pure white marble, each one unique in its own design. Tall, venerable-looking men with faces like birds and shrouded in tattered robes, were hailing passerbys with leaflets written in an untidy scrawl. Thin, crudely made automatons were heaving boxes over the sides of the pier to other robots in ships below. 
Their copper plating turned green from the corrosive seawater and tinged black from the constant stream of smoke emerging from their bodies. As the crowd around him flowed past, Vel caught glimpses of the port town. From what he could tell, this world was currently somewhere along the beginnings of its industrial revolution. Black smoke poured from chimneys, creating a gray haze over everything. Old-fashioned gas lamps rose like metal sentries every dozen yards or so. Carts drawn by fat, equine animals rumbled down the cobblestone roads. The entire beach was surrounded with boats, and a faded wooden dock circled the market, creating an everlasting outdoor market that baked in the white light of the sun. Vel pushed a finger against his temple. This was not good. He would have to wait for the local technology to catch up just to get what he needed to fix the portal locker. And that could take quite some time. This thought began to raise his blood pressure. A huge shadow broke over the street, racing to cover the entire town. Half alarmed, Vel looked up expecting... Well, he didn't really know what to expect. But in his line of work, large shadows never amounted to anything good. Vel stared, wide-eyed, at the barnacle-encrusted bottom of a huge clipper ship. It glided through the air fifty feet above him, sailing steadily downwards until it slid smoothly into the waters of the harbor. Instead of tattered sails, there was a massive cloth balloon tethered to its mast like a dirigible. Oi, get out of the way! Vel spun around in time to see a hulking stone beast carrying a wooden crate larger than it was over one shoulder. The creature had a fish skull carved where its head should have been, and it was bearing down on him with empty eye sockets and a sinister yellow smile of razor-sharp teeth. Vel staggered back, plowing into the crowd behind him. The creature laughed a deep, booming bark, snapping its jaws at him as he passed, hissing out the words, Filthy foreigners, standing around, acting like it owned a place. Vel frowned as he followed the creature with his eyes. Hey mister, you mind giving us a hand? Vel spun again, half expecting to be plowed over. Instead, he looked down to see a young, dark-skinned woman nursing a scraped elbow. Her face was soot-smeared, and her clothes were dirty from constant use. Oh, uh, sorry about that, he mumbled hastily, extending his mechanical hand down to haul her to her feet. She stumbled into him as she found her footing, and then shoved him away with a shoulder. Get your hands off me, Grandad! What kind of girl do you take me for, eh? Vel put his hands up defensively. Whoa, I didn't, I mean, I don't, uh, sorry? The young girl gave him a wink, pushed past him, and disappeared into the crowd. Okay. A little flustered, Vel shrugged it off and made his way back to the edge of the street, ducking into an alley while he got his bearings. Sniffing the air, he turned to face the direction of the heart of the market. Peering around the corner, he could see it was the tallest tent along the boardwalk, with more than twenty merchants vying for attention at varying levels. If he was going to find anyone that could help him, this would be the place. While he had always considered himself to be a fairly intelligent being, the design of his brother's travel device was unique. Even when it was whole, Vel wasn't able to figure out how the device managed to alter gateways, or even operate at all. But perhaps he could find someone who was more versed in engineering. Vel reached his hand into his pocket, hoping he still had some of those gold coins from a few worlds back. He didn't have any local currency, but gold tends to speak everywhere. Nope, not in that pocket. He dived into another, searching for his wallet. Nothing. A quick inspection, and he surmised the problem. Everything was gone. 
including the portal locker. Vel bristled and whirled around, facing the crowd where the young girl had disappeared. With a low growl, he uttered, Computer, I need a favor. Piper ducked into an alcove between two abandoned vendor tents. She crouched back on her heels, her boots digging into her thighs, chuckling while she emptied the contents of her hall onto the ground. Easy as pie, she thought. She poked through her findings, turning over the small heap of things she had lifted from the man. She plucked out a small cylindrical tube that was more rust than metal. It was long and slim, with a seam near the middle, but it didn't appear to have any function. There were no buttons, but there was a slim cavity near one of the ends. Maybe a weapon? Piper gave the cylinder a twist, and a toothbrush popped out of the opening. She dropped the tube behind her with a sigh and reached for the rolled leather pouch. She tugged against the tattered leather string and dumped out the contents. An assortment of crudely fashioned tools clattered to the ground. She picked one up and examined it with a scrutinizing glare. They might be worth a copper or two, if nobody looked close enough to see that they weren't the standard sizes. She tossed them with the toothbrush. Her pile of useless was growing as a handful of washers, foreign coins, and an odd assortment of screws and bolts joined the leather pouch in the tube. Piper begrudgingly picked the charred hunk of metal up and examined it. She had been hoping that perhaps she could have salvaged some of the innards for parts, but the device, or what was left of it, was burnt to a crisp. She grumbled and slid it into a pocket, hoping she could convince a local tinker it was a good bargain. Piper reached for the wallet. It was an oddly shaped currency holder, she thought as she unfolded it. It was worn leather, with many snaps and separate compartments. Surely, with a money bag as extravagant as this, there had to be something of value. She found only slim holographic cards inside, made of some type of flexible glass. While they were pretty to look at, they weren't currency. But they were definitely unique, and perhaps worth something for their unusual properties. Piper flicked through them, and found a faded photograph tucked away in one of the slots. She couldn't make out the inhabitants of the picture, even as she squinted at the old parchment with a hard gaze. She shoved it back into the billfold and tucked it into her vest next to the charred device. It had been a long time since she had wasted her efforts on a target that was this penniless. She slumped back against one of the old tents, dejected. Her head hit the old wooden panel with a resounding thunk. She was too lost in her thoughts, trying to think which tinker might give her the most for the tools, the glass cards, and maybe even the toothbrush, that she didn't notice the crunching of footsteps until a long shadow enveloped her, and she realized she wasn't alone. She tried to scramble away, but a firm grip above her elbow stopped her. I want my stuff back, Val barked the order, glaring down at her as he did. It wasn't a request. The young girl tried to struggle away from him, but found his grip was ironclad. <laughs> Let go! I ain't done nothing! Her other hand began slapping at him uselessly, even as she was hauled to her feet. Vel tightened his hold on her skinny arm and pulled her close. Look, I don't want any trouble. I just want my stuff back so I can get off this damn island. Listen, mister... I don't know what you're on about, but I ain't never stole a thing in me life. God's honest truth. Vel frowned and looked down at the pile of bolts and washers a few feet behind her. He scowled when he saw his toothbrush sitting bristled down in the dirt. He pulled his face back towards hers, his scowl deepening. Where's the rest of my stuff? The girl didn't say anything this time, not even to mouth off. She stopped struggling and turned her face up and away from his, her eyes clenched shut but defiant. Vel sighed. 
All right, if that's how you want to play it. He nodded down the street. I passed a few guards down this way. I'm sure they'll be happy to know of your extracurricular activities. Oh, no, wait. She started to struggle as he dragged her along down the dusty road. Y you don't want to do this. You're not from here. They'll toss you in jail. Vel scoffed. Uh-huh, right. You stole from me, but I'll end up in jail. I'm serious, Tin Man. I don't know where you come from, but around here we got rules. And them rules are no foreigners. You land us both in jail. She was struggling harder now, and they were starting to attract stares. Vel stopped, looking down at her. She was younger than he had expected, now that she had been dragged into the sunlight. Her copper-colored skin seemed out of place among all the pasty fishmongers, meaning, like him, she wasn't from here. Her deep amber eyes were searching his. Fine. Just return my stuff and I'll let you go. Is there a problem here? Vel looked over his shoulder to see two guards sauntering towards them. Apparently, they had made enough of a scene that now he was stuck putting the girl's theory to the test. No, everything is fine. Just talking to my niece here. Piper hissed at him. Niece, we look nothing alike. Vel loosened his grip, whispering, Shut up, before he turned towards the officers. One was a tall, thin, bird-faced man, wearing ground-length robes of navy blue and emerald. The other was a burly human with a pug face and shoulder-length greasy black hair. They both had dark, scrutinizing eyes that glared down at them in a demanding fashion. The birdman cocked his head to the side, extending a clawed hand in a receiving manner. Very well. We just need to see your papers. My what? Vel let go of the girl, stepping slightly in front of her. The burly man flexed one of his massive fists. By order of the High Inquisitor, all persons of this realm must present their papers of identification as proof of citizenship. It seemed as though the officer had said this line so often that it almost fell lazily from his lips. Vel nodded slowly. Look, I don't have any papers. I don't even know where I am or how I ended up in this place. I'm just passing through, trying to find my brother. All I want is to leave and to get back to my home. I don't want any trouble. With a speed surprising for a man that large, the human guard snatched Vel's hands and twisted them behind his back before the cyborg even knew what was happening. Vel grunted in pain as the large man pushed him down, slamming his face into the cobblestones and began fishing out a pair of crude iron handcuffs while his knee dug into Vel's spine. Vel turned his head to the side in time to see the birdman moving toward the young girl, who was standing stock still, looking down at him with a horrified expression. Run, kid! Piper snapped out of it and tried to dodge as the feathered guard reached for her, but his long, clawed fingers snagged a fistful of her hair. He pulled tight against her, attempting to rein her in. Resistance is a crime. Stay still. Piper kicked backwards, aiming her boot heel into the side of the officer's knee. She couldn't muster enough force to actually break it, but that was one of the weakest joints of the body, and the talons that had the firm grip on her hair snapped open. The birdman cried out and crumpled to the side. Piper tore off down the street, disappearing once again into the crowd. The injured guard staggered to his feet, pulled a whistle from beneath the neckline of his robe, and took after her, using the sharp noises to get the crowd to part before him. The guard atop Vel stood and hauled his prisoner upright. Well, well, illegal immigration, resisting arrest, conspiring to help a prisoner escape the guard said as he counted off all these offenses on stubby, fat fingers. Oh, and assaulting an officer. 
he let out a deep rumble of a laugh. Looks like you're in a heap of trouble, boy. Vel worked his jaw back and forth, making sure the bone wasn't damaged. Assaulting an officer? I never touched you. The guard nodded. Say, that's all just conjecture on your part. It's up to a court of law to decide what's truth and what's not. Way I say it, it's my word against yours. And a fine, upstanding officer like myself never lies. Vel narrowed his eyes as the guard grabbed him by the arm and started pulling him back towards the street. Vel clutched his mechanical wrist and twisted, allowing the hand to come free, a feature that he had insisted upon after being forced to rip it off in an earlier adventure. The cuff fell free, and he reattached his hand. Too late, the officer realized what had happened. What? Now listen here, boy. The guard's words were cut off as Vel latched his metal digits around the man's collarbone, digging the fingers into the tender flesh around it and threatening to snap the bone. The guard cried out and dropped to one knee. One, I'm not a boy. I'm probably ten times your age. Two, officers never lie. Vel leaned in close his red, cybernetic eye beginning to glow in contrast to his green one. Might as well make that last charge accurate. We can't make a liar out of you, now can we? After retrieving the small pile of his belongings the little sneak thief had discarded, Vel wasn't really sure what to do, and returned to the garbage-strewn alley he had arrived in. He slumped against the wall, He'd been here an hour, and already he was a wanted felon. No gateway, no portal locker, no wallet. Stranded on a world that smelled like a whale's stomach, and no idea how to find his way back. A piece of paper fluttered down and landed in his lap. Inspecting it, he saw himself and Eric as kids, standing with their mom. Vel looked up to see the young girl looking down at him from her perch on the edge of the roof. She gave him a calculating look. You said you wanted to find your brother. Was that real, or just something you made up? Vel grunted. It's real. That's why I was so determined to get that device back. Piper retrieved the portal locker from her grubby vest. How is this thing supposed to help? It opens gateways between worlds. My brother and I got separated when the device got fried. I need to fix it so I can find him again. Piper nodded to herself. Okay, I think I can help. Vel gave her an incredulous look. What, really? You believe me? Just like that? I tell you I'm from a different world. A different plane of existence. And that doesn't even phase you? Piper tossed the portal locker down to Vel and began climbing down the rain gutter. Take a look around, mister. You ain't exactly the first person to climb that. Now, you want me help or not? Vel blinked. That would explain the diversity. Uh, yeah. That sounds great. Right. Before I say yes, I just have one question. She paced back and forth, staring at him so hard... Vel thought she might be trying to read the back of his skull. How in the blazes did you find me back there? Nobody's ever tracked me down that fast. Nobody. Vel grinned and pulled a small metal cylinder out of his coat. You'd be surprised how often you lose your toothbrush as a realm hopper. So, eventually, I put a tracking device in it. Piper rolled her eyes. Bloody tinkers and their toys... Fine, I'll help. My name's Piper, Queen Proper of the Back Alleys of Silverport. She held out her hand. Nice to meet ya. Mel smirked and gave a bow before reaching out to shake her hand. Name's Vel. A pleasure, your highness. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron.
Join us as the adventure unfolds with new chapters releasing every few weeks. So, let me see if I understand this right. Two of my officers were manhandled by, if I am reading this correctly, a little girl and her elderly uncle. To be fair, I was not manhandled. Oh, shut it, Charlie. That little girl kicked you so hard, you were squawking like a seagull while she ran away. Says the man who was found unconscious in the middle of an alley. This girl was stronger than she looked. That does bring up a question. How did an old man manage to incapacitate you? Well, it wasn't an old man. Not really. He just said he was. So, an old man who was not an old man, and a young girl with superhuman strength, are running around Silverport, attacking officers of the law? And to think, I turned down a job with the Armada for this. Fine, if you come across any more prepubescent or geriatric ne'er-do-wells, I suggest you call for reinforcements. Dismissed. Well, that could have gone better. Shut up.